So I'd like to introduce Mark Miller, who is our fly fishing coordinator. He's also our communications chair for the chapter, and he has agreed to be our guest fly tire tonight. So Mark, I will turn it over to you. And Karen, for your knowledge, I will be, uh, will be tying for about a half hour. And then I have a few announcements and I'll turn it over to you. Sound okay? Sounds great. Great, thank you. So Mark, see if you can get us connected. <laughs> okay, uh, how, how's my volume? Hopefully it's okay. It's good. Okay, good, good. And I think everybody can see the, see the fly here. Um, and uh, yeah, I heard that, that we're being recorded, so I, I need to watch out what I say. So. Yeah, Mark, you, you need to switch your iPhone still. We're looking at your desktop at the moment. Oh, oh okay, maybe my iPhone went to sleep. Yep. Yep, sure did. Sorry about that. And it's going to make me put in, I'm going to have to take it off my mount. I hope that didn't happen during the... What is your mother's first and last name? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. I hope it doesn't do that right in the middle of the tying. No, I don't think it should. Once you uh, start to share your screen, then it should keep you on. Okay. Okay. Good. There we go. It's a pretty fragile setup I have here, so it could all come crashing down in a minute. Okay, well, let's see. Now, we're, uh, it, it didn't happen yet. You gotta uh, share your screen still, oh, I think, okay, and then okay. choose that device. Thank you. Uh, just a second here. Okay, um, let's see here. Perfect. Okay, hopefully. Yep. Great. Yeah. All right, all right, thanks. All right, yeah, I was going to start this off with a uh, compare done. I don't know how many uh, of the folks on the, uh, on the Zoom here this evening uh, have tied or fished with a compare done. I, I just started doing it probably about three years ago. I watched uh, Rick Takahashi tie this at the, uh, what is it, Big Beaver Brewery in Loveland. And he tied a few up and I was looking over his shoulder and then he had me sit down at his vice and gave me a, a great lesson. So uh, hopefully I, I haven't tied any of these in a while, but uh, hopefully I can get the, uh, the deer hair to cooperate. And it seems like a, a lot of tires, especially new uh, new tires, might be uh, a little bit hesitant to uh, to use the deer hair. Sorry, my camera is uh, moving on me. Yeah, what a what a simple pattern. Uh, you know, just a deer hair tail and a dubbed body, and then deer hair uh, for the wing. I'm using a little bit bigger uh, hook here this evening, you know, just to make sure it's nicely visible. Uh, so this is a actually a size 12. Normally I would use uh, like like the the finished fly I had in the vise there a minute ago. I uh, had good success with that during PMD hatches on the pooter on a, in a size 14. Yeah, the neat thing about this pattern is that, uh, I know as, as Marty knows and, and several of you probably that have tied this, it's, it's so easy to, you know, just vary the color of the body and you can go from PMD, to, you know, to a bluing olive, to a green drake. All right, so we're going to get the... Get the tail on here.
All right, then I've just got some PMD uh, dubbing here that uh, works nicely for a real nice, nice tight uh, body material. I had a photo uh, that I tried to find today and I couldn't find it on my computer, but uh, again, it was about three years ago on the pooter uh, upstream from the hatchery. And I got there around, I don't know, three or four in the afternoon and the, the air was just full of PMDs. And I uh, picked up an adult that was, uh, you know, with its laying flat, wings flat on the water couldn't fly because it was soaked and I uh, actually put it right on my uh, rod right next to, to this fly and it was amazing the the color and the size and everything was was really right on and I think that day I just caught the tail end of the hatch caught maybe seven or eight fish but I, I caught two fish in the first three casts <laughs> and it was pretty pretty exciting all right so we got the body dub there then I need to uh, get some uh, hair into the stacker here. And then just a quick comment on this finished fly that, that you saw a minute ago, I uh, dubbed over the butt ends of the uh, hair. But uh, if you guys, uh, probably a lot of you look at Charlie Cravens, he's got great fly time videos on his website. He actually leaves the uh, the butts of the hair exposed and says that actually helps with the flotation or the buoyancy of the fly. So uh, I'll, I'll probably try that, to, uh, try that tonight. Hey Mark, any sense on if these are better as a high floating flyer, if it actually helps them to ride a little lower in the water? I, my, my, understanding or thought is that uh yeah that, that these will ride you know right on the right on the surface a lot a lot lower you know than a hackled fly and uh, uh yeah a lot of times i think that's i think that's more more effective yeah that's my sense of how i've always done the best fish in a comparison it's kind of right sitting in that film yeah and i've i've actually had days in the past where uh using a regular hackled fly and get all these refusals and then end up, you know, trimming that hackle off. So it's flat on the bottom and, and rides lower and then finally start getting some takes. Mm -hmm. Now the hard, hard part for me on this is to always figure out how much, where to tie that in. So I get the wing, the height that I want it. Now the key here on this hair is I just take a, a really loose, wrap and then a second loose wrap and I'm going to keep uh, going to keep pinching that hair tightly so it doesn't spin all the way around my hook shank and hopefully we'll have it flared you know on the about a, almost 180 degrees let's see how that came out Uh, not too bad. I mean, look, looks ugly right now, but uh, I'll take a few more wraps so it doesn't move on me, and then I'll start trimming those butts. Of course, when Charlie Craven is so good, and Marty, you could probably do this that uh, he trims those butts to just the right length before he ties it in. So after he ties it in, he doesn't even have anything to trim. All right, then I'm gonna sweep those fibers 
up and back. And we'll just build a little <clears throat> thread dam. Hold those up. And I'll use a little bit of dubbing here in a minute too to keep that wing up where we want it. Hey, you see those butt ends? And again, uh, I think, I guess, personal preference, if you want to, you could cover that up with dubbing. I could trim them a little shorter. But uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much how, uh, how Charlie Craven does it. So I'm just going to leave those butt ends uh, exposed. When you look at it from uh, underneath, it just makes that abdomen look a little bit, a little bit wider, which I think is, uh, is probably pretty realistic. All right, um, that's, uh, that's about it. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, whip, whip finish and, uh, and that'll be the last step. Mark, you didn't, <clears throat> you didn't really mention it, but putting the wing back away from the eye is a good thing on this fly. Oh, oh, good point, good point. Yeah, thanks, Marty. I mean, mainly, I guess you're right. You just you just don't want to crowd the fly, and uh, and probably probably gives it a more realistic look. Would you say, Marty? Well, yeah. The the mayfly wings are mounted. The, the bugs' wings are mounted a little farther back, so showing some some uh, thorax up front is a good thing. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And again, uh, sometimes, uh, at least uh, with with my experience, if I'll uh, let those, those hairs will spin a little bit further around that hook shank. So I'll get a few that are hanging down, and I just I, I leave those too. I don't even trim them off because if you know if you look at a mayfly adult right from underneath, then you you see those legs uh, spread out on the surface film. So I almost think that uh, might even enhance it. So I'll have a few hairs uh, hanging down like that, and then I would just do a little bit of a little bit of head cement, and then we are done. All right. Any uh, uh oh, is, did my camera stop working? Oh yeah, it looks like it went to sleep again, Mark. Okay. Yep, sure did. Hmm. I guess I'll have to uh, just tap it now and then or something to, uh, at least we made it through the fly. Yeah, yeah, good timing. <laughs> <laughs> good looking fly, I'd fish it. I've got to take it out of the, out of my holder here so that I can. Do the face recognition, there we go. Okay. There's always, no matter how much you plan, there's always some technical difficulty in there. Oh yeah, yeah. This is uh, the new normal with Zoom meetings. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, what did I do wrong this time? Oh, okay. Oh boy. Sorry, guys.
Looks like you went into the photos, Mark. We're, we're not seeing the camera anymore. There we go. Okay, let's see here. Yeah, I might point out for those of you watching, um, if you want to see, you can blow up the image a little bit on your monitor. If you go to the top where it says viewing Mark Miller's section under view options, just click that little arrow and then you can go to zoom. And you can go up, I've got mine on 150%, it flies a little bigger that way. So it's up to you if you want to try that. Good, thanks, Mickey. I had meant to mention that at the out start and forgot. Yeah, me too. <laughs> well, is it still nice and uh, nice and clear for you or focused when you, when you zoom in like that? Yeah, at 150, it's very clear. If you go up to 200, it gets a little uh, pixelated. Okay, okay. But 150 is fine and it's plenty big. On, I'm just looking at my laptop, so it's working Good. well. All right. All right, let's see, this next pattern, uh, I don't have a finished one handy here, I should, but it's, a, it's just a simple, simple uh, damsel supply nymph. And basically it's got a marabou tail and then some uh, hair's ear dubbing. And that's, uh, that is really, really it. Um, super simple fly, especially uh, for, for beginning tires, but this thing has been, a real producer uh, for me and you know whether it's a uh, cold water uh, you know trout uh, with still waters of course but uh, I've had great luck with uh, for with trout and then also uh, also warm water uh, I went out to Dixon Lake uh, yesterday in between running some errands I just had like an hour and uh, yeah through the dams out there and of course, caught a bunch of little little bluegills, a couple little bass, a few crappie, and some pretty good size shiners. I mean, they were like you know five or six inches long. Never seen that before. I'm not sure if they were in there, you know, since they were uh, used as bait, or exactly what happened. Mark, what size hook is that? Uh, let's see, this is a uh, 10, and, and again, I, I tie mine mostly in 12 or 12 or 14. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I just did this a little bit, a little bit bigger again to help it show up. Get my light back there. All right, so just put down a thread base. And then we'll get the uh, get a marabou tail. I'm just going to take just just a few fibers off of this one feather. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna pinch those ends off because I, I want to get back Mark, he's tired. to those fibers where they're really webby, and then uh, what he's doing. that will really really move nicely uh, in the water as you right. as you twitch the thing. So the first time I, uh, oh, my air conditioning unit just kicked on, so I don't know if you can hear me over it. It's pretty loud since I've, I've 
been banished to the basement from my fly tying desk. <laughs> but the first time I became aware of this fly was up at Steamboat Lake in the early 80s. And uh, I had just gotten out of the Air Force and was working as a seasonal for the uh, Division of Wildlife, just doing a creel survey, you know, just going around talking to people, finding out how many fish they've caught, how many hours they were fishing, you know, try to come up with a catch rate. And I was probably talking to, you know, 100, 200 people every day for this creel survey. And uh, most people, you know, were putting salmon eggs out on the bottom, worms, you know, catching, I don't you know, fish that were, you know, 11, 12 inch fish. And then all of a sudden I ran into three or four guys with fly rods and they had kept a, a pretty good stringer of fish and these fish were all like 14 to 18 inches. So, uh, so yeah, I, I asked them about a hundred questions, you know, where they were fishing, what they were using. And yeah, this, this uh, was what the fly looked like that they, uh, that they were using. And so I have used this thing in still waters for a long, long time. So I'm just going to keep dubbing up to the uh, up to the eye of the hook, and then sometimes I'll take a little, uh, you know, dubbing brush or and, and just kind of uh, pull some of those guard hairs out, make it look a little little buggier. And, uh, whoops, let me get my camera back centered. In fact, usually I don't, don't even make the tail quite that long, but uh, that, that's how simple it is. And what I like about this fly is that, uh, you know, usually I, if you've ever seen the, the real thing, you know, swimming in the lake, I, you know, I've had days in my float tube where there's damsel nymphs all over my float tube. They're craw crawling up my chest, uh, crawling up my neck. And you watch these things, wiggle in the water and um, and then all of a sudden they'll they'll stop wiggling and and of course what what looks like a tail right is their gills and that tail will kind of flare up and out and that's exactly what this what this marabou does and uh, so most hits you know I'll, I'll twitch it three or four times you know move it a few inches and almost every hit will just come on the sink and uh, you know you'll just see your line tighten up or the slap go out, or maybe you'll see the end of your fly line just jump, you know, half an inch uh, when they take it. But uh, yeah, they uh, they like to take this thing on the sink. I usually don't weight it either. I usually just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll fish the edge of the weed beds. You know, maybe I'm in water four to six feet deep at the most. And uh, yeah, this has been, once in a while, I'll put a split shot and put it under an indicator. If I've done that like down at Antero Reservoir, you know, fishing 10 and 12 feet deep. But uh, yeah, if you ever get a chance to fish Steamboat Lake, those, uh, there's really, really weedy, weedy coves on the west side. And if you can get out there in a float tube and just work along the, the uh, edge of those weed beds, uh, hang on because you can almost have the rod yanked out of your hands. Well, that's it for the, for the damsel. Um, should, we, uh, should we call it there, Mickey? I think so. Uh, we've got about four minutes to six. So, Mark, I'd just like to thank you for volunteering to do this. And I like that little fly, that last one, the best. That's uh, easy to tie. and It's easy and quick, and man, it works. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to know. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Anybody, Thanks. Mark. Thanks. Anybody, anybody have any questions for Mark? All right, well, for those of you that have just joined in the last five minutes or so, that was Mark Miller, who's our communications chair and our fly fishing events coordinator.
and jack of all trades. And so, Mark, I just want to thank you again. Oh, thanks. It was fun. I appreciate it. So I'll go ahead and uh, stop sharing now, right, Zach? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Again, thanks for the uh, technical assist there. Good job. And I'm going to share mine. Just uh, we'll wait a few minutes as people come in. I think we have about 21 last time I looked. So. People might want to know if there's a, if Karen and I are related, but no relation. <laughs> That's a, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> I was wondering myself, but I didn't think there was so a relationship. <laughs> Cousins. <laughs> <laughs> Miller time. <laughs> uh. well, Mickey, if you don't mind me chiming in real quickly uh, with Karen. Um, Karen, I don't know if you know Bob Green from our chapter. Uh, yeah. He, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, maybe three years ago, he took his 10 car rod to Alaska one day and he caught about 10 or 12 big chum salmon on that tin car rod. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, no, he has a Kyogen. Uh, he, we, I used his photo uh, on some yeah. of my presentations, but we go up every year to Rapids Camp Lodge uh, and now uh, they're the only uh, certified tin lodge anywhere in Alaska. And wow. Uh, they do, they offer Tenkara experiences and they uh, have our rods uh, up there. So they, you know, they have a, they, they carry a, a couple of our different rods. Um, and we go, they, they bring us up every year actually to work with their guides. So I'll be going up in July and um, wow they rotate us through all their guides and make sure they know how to set up and land and, and do all that stuff. So, yep. He was, he was, uh, yeah, <laughs> he's been very instrumental. <laughs> I use his photo a lot. <laughs> so he's the poster child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could say that, you know, I mean, he's one of the first, uh, uh, guys to do that and I just loved his his uh, attitude and you know kind of curious spirit but yep he done it we uh, landed silvers uh, last uh, last year when we went up that was the first time I actually got into a silver I've done lots of chums and sockeye um, and uh, a couple kings uh, but also had a shot at a silver, which I actually have a video. <laughs> if if anybody wants to see it <laughs> uh, on the presentation, so it's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd love to see the video. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, there's uh, a little bit of a potty language issue in it, um, <laughs> but uh, it's there's there's kind of a funny story behind it because it was the last day uh, of fishing and everybody in the party had landed a silver. They were just starting to come in so they were far and few between uh, and very strong and very healthy um, and <laughs> we had called it the guides were loading the plane and I was like I am not leaving until I get a silver. <laughs> So everybody had packed up and I was still casting and I finally, you know, I was down there by myself on the shore and all of a sudden I hooked in and I was so exhausted because I probably had made, you know, 
I don't know, 500 casts that day um, and had landed lots of chums, but this was my first silver and I was wiped out. I, I was pretty exhausted, but I landed it. Uh, and uh, we just finished eating him <laughs> about <laughs> a couple weeks ago. So it was really exciting. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay, well, let's go ahead and uh, get the meeting kicked off. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I'm not sure any of us likes the Zoom method, but with the virus, we're still restricted on uh, group meetings. Uh, we're hoping this will be our last meeting for a few months, as is our practice. Uh, we're hoping that early fall, maybe we'll be able to get together. We'll just have to... Uh, keep in communication with the county and the city and uh, senior center and that kind of thing to see what's going to be allowable by our first meeting next uh, season, which will be in September. So, but thank you for joining. Uh, I know it's a kind of a second best way of going. Um, I've got just a few announcements uh, and then we'll turn it over to uh, Karen Miller, our uh, guest speaker for, the, for tonight. So, we have uh, some new leaders I wanted to point out. Um, Jeannie Weaver is our new board secretary, uh, replacing Frank Bubb. Uh, Frank uh, has been a member of the board of, trust of directors for a few years. He became secretary about uh, two years ago, I think. Unfortunately, he is leaving town. He is moving away, and so we had a vacancy at the secretary position. And Jeannie Weaver came forward and said, I will do it. And so the board appointed her at our last board meeting and we're very excited to have her on board. Uh, David Beatty is a new director at large and Ron Dixon stepped down from the board, uh, you know, I, I guess in March. Uh, and so that created a vacancy and uh, David Beatty agreed to step into that position. Uh, both of these positions, uh, are, are there until we have our next election, and that uh, will be in November. Uh, typically, uh, before we amended the bylaws, we would be having a business meeting tonight, the May uh, meeting, where we would have elections and awards and things like that. Uh, but as it turned out, uh, with the new bylaws, uh, the elections have been changed to uh, the November meeting, and the new board will take their place uh, starting in uh, January. So this is our, these two folks will, will be on the board until the next election, so they're board appointed and uh, we'll be moving forward after that. Also, we're very excited to announce that Dick Jeffries is our new conservation chair. Ron Dixon was the conservation chair as well. He's waving his hands there for those of you that have the gallery view. Uh, Dick, uh, I think a lot of you know Dick. He's a uh, been very involved in the chapter in past years. He was uh, president for three years, I think ending in 2015. Uh, he became very active at the CTU level where he was on the board there and then actually vice president of that board. Uh, and then for personal reasons, he had to uh, kind of step out of a lot of these activities but he has uh, assured me that he is ready to get back in the saddle and lead the way on the conservation side of things. So, Dick, we're very pleased to have you leading our conservation committee. Uh, we still have a vacancy. The membership chair position is still vacant. Rick Musselman has been doing a fantastic job. Uh, he, he has gotten very busy at work and has asked to be relieved, although he will still be doing a lot of the membership list maintenance and that kind of thing. He might, I think, still sending out letters to people that have inadvertently lapsed in their membership. And I know we have a few of us there. Uh, but so if you have any interest at all, this is basically uh, coordinating a bunch of volunteers that are helping out uh, at the membership level. Uh, and so if you have any interest, please contact Dennis Cook or Will Hewitt. Dennis, I see you there. Can you raise your hand so everybody can see you? And uh, let them know of your interest in getting involved. Uh, Dennis is the chair of our Leadership Development and Nominations Committee and can tell you a lot about how the uh, chapter 
operates and what uh, is involved in being a chair of, a, of any of the committees that we have. Unfortunately, we've had to cancel our youth camp for this year. Uh, with the virus, it's just a very uncertain situation with what will be happening at the end of July. I believe that most of the camps around the country have already been canceled. I know that Colorado Trout Unlimited has canceled their youth camp. That's a week-long event. If you would like to have your children uh, or grandchildren involved in the youth camp for next year, uh, that will start on July 26th. Also, those who are enrolled already in this year's camp will automatically be enrolled for next year. So, uh, Dave Hoistler, uh, and you can raise your hand there, Dave. He'll be reaching out to folks as the, the time comes up. Colorado Trout Unlimited is also putting on some form of a virtual camp that kids can register for. All that information is on our website. And I would encourage you to go to Rocky Mountain Fly, flycasters.org to check that out if you have children between the ages of 14 and 17. And then finally, I wanted to announce a release of a new initiative. It's a communication plan for the Pooter Headwaters Project. And that is a project that will be a signature project for our chapter as well as Colorado Trout Unlimited. We are working very closely with the Forest Service, Parks and Wildlife, uh, uh, USF, um, I'm sorry, uh, Fish and Wildlife, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, the Park Service to restore the greenback cutthroat trout up in the headwaters of the Poudre River above Long Grau Reservoir. As you can imagine, this is a massive effort. We, we are figuring it'll take about 10 to 12 years to complete. It does involve going in and removing invasive fish so that the greenback will have a better chance to get established in this headwaters. It's about 37 miles of uh, streams up there that we will be going in and managing those waters so that greenbacks can uh, survive in that climate up there. This was a team effort. Uh, Phil Wright uh, wrote the original grant uh, proposal to CTU that they funded this. Ron Dixon and myself and Mark Miller have been involved as well. Uh, we have a number of uh, things in this. Two of them I have here. These are written documents. Uh, Helping to Restore Colorado's Native Trout is basically an excerpt from a book written by Dr. Kurt Fausch, who's Professor Emeritus at CSU. And he really lays out the need to remove non-native fish when we are restoring cutthroat trout. We get a lot of questions when we're out in the community about this, and we thought that these written documents would help us uh, pass the word about why it's necessary to go in and remove fish and then restore it with the native fish. And as if you don't know, a uh, greenback cutthroat trout is actually the Colorado state fish. So it's very apropos. There's other efforts within the state restoring greenback, but this will be by far the largest greenback restoration uh, within the state. And then on the right side of the screen is a uh, image of a trifold that will talk more in depth about the project itself, the Pooter Headwaters project. This will say where it's going to be, why we're going to do it, and how we're going to do it to some extent. And this will be handed out at events. Uh, hopefully the next time we all get together, we'll have a lot of copies of this. And, or if you want one uh, now, just let us know and we can mail these things to you uh, or get them out another way. Uh, they are also on our website uh, and available for download if you want to look at them that way. So these are two of the uh, three parts of these grants. And the third part uh, is a video, actually, a very nicely done video uh, of uh, talking about how this is going to occur. So I'm gonna show that now, if the technology works. And so I'm gonna stop sharing this, and I will start sharing the video. It's only three minutes, so hang with me here. And here we go.
Can you all hear this? Yeah, man, it sounds good. Hi, I'm Kurt Fausch from the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology at Colorado State University. I'm a professor of fisheries biology and I've worked on stream fish, specifically trout and salmon in the West and throughout the world. So in Colorado, the native trout are cutthroat trout uh, and specifically here in this part of Colorado, greenback cutthroat trout along Colorado's front range. The greenback, once thought to be extinct, is designated as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act and efforts have begun to restore a large population to the Cache Lapooter headwaters, located near Long Draw Reservoir in Colorado. The biggest threat to the remaining populations we have of the greenback are non-native trout like brook trout, which were brought from the east in the late 1800s. Our research shows that cutthroat trout need larger streams with warmer temperatures that are free from brook trout if they're gonna thrive in Colorado. PhD student Doug Peterson and I conducted a big field experiment and found that cutthroat trout fry survived 13 times better when brook trout were removed compared to control streams. And survival of yearling cutthroat was more than twice as high when the brook trout were removed. Surprisingly, however, adult cutthroat survival was the same whether brook trout were removed or not. So the experiment proved that brook trout could decimate cutthroat populations over time by competition and predation during their first two years of life. PhD students Amy Herrig and Mark Coleman found that when native cutthroat trout are isolated in high mountain streams above barriers that keep brook trout out, the fry can't grow enough to survive the first winter. Basically, they can't get large enough and lay down enough fat during the short growing season. Fisheries researchers and managers are working to identify streams with higher temperatures that can support greenback cutthroat survival and reproduction, and to establish barriers to keep brook trout out. This is why the Long Drop Project is so important. Cutthroat trout need larger streams with warmer temperatures that are free from brook trout if they're going to thrive in Colorado. The team of scientists and volunteers from a group of federal and state agencies and nonprofits and universities are following in the footsteps of my colleague Bob Benke, who pioneered cutthroat trout conservation. And they're working to create a stronghold for these fish above a barrier in the Big South Cache Theater watershed. To learn more and to help restore Colorado's native trout, visit the Rocky Mountain Flycasters website. Okay, so that was the video that, that's been produced. It will be distributed widely on a number of websites. The Forest Service has asked for it. Uh, the, there's a big group of scientists uh, across the agencies that are working on this. They've asked for it as well. It's been shared with them. And they, uh, the written documents also. I'd also like to point out that the written documents all have a call to action, like you just saw in the video. And hopefully we'll be able to uh, garner the volunteers or financial support to help do this project. The project is underfunded right now, we think by about a half million dollars. This was a result of a uh, request by, what's the name of the irrigation? It always was uh, water supply and storage uh, up around the Continental Divide when they wanted a, a lease again on Forest Service land. Uh, and it, uh, the deal was worked out to where the home, uh, water supply and storage would actually fund the project to restore cutthroat trout, but it's still a little bit underfunded, and so we'll be looking for financial uh, donations as well. So with that, unless there's any questions about that project, I'm ready to introduce uh, Karen Miller. I'm seeing some... Uh, uh, chats. If you want to ask questions on the chat, uh, let me know. Uh, we have a thank you to Mark um, and a couple of thank you to not, and uh, Chris Dietrich asks, are we going to fish them all out? <laughs> uh, and that's the, uh, the brook trout and uh, probably some uh, rainbows up there. Uh, hopefully we'll do as much of that as we can. 
but it's almost impossible to entirely rid the streams of all the brook trout uh, up there. So we'll see what happens and we'll cross that bridge when we, when we come to it. Okay, I don't see any other questions. So at this time, I'm very pleased to introduce Karen Miller from Zen Tenkara. Karen talked to us a couple years ago. I remember you gave a presentation, I think it was about two years ago. <coughs> A just fascinating presentation at that point and I'm um, really looking forward to an update that she has. She's taken Zen or Tenkara to a whole new level and I'm really excited to learn about these techniques that she's going to talk about. So Karen, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, thank you. Um, so uh, we're gonna touch base very quickly on just uh, some, some real basics. Uh, because uh, when I just kind of asked about uh, the group uh, experience with Tinkara, it was uh, it was kind of mixed. Uh, some people uh, have Tinkara rods uh, and have used them and are experienced. Other people uh, have Tinkara rods, but they never use them, which seems to be uh, very common. And then, uh, you know, other people uh, have friends that do Tenkara or they've seen it on the river, but they don't have any experience with it. So um, I'm going to uh, share a screen. I have a PowerPoint presentation and we're gonna jump in and out of that presentation. And uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to uh, stop and ask. I'm pretty thorough, I think I'll cover it all. Uh, as I said, we're going to do a real quick and dirty on just sort of how to set your rod up. Uh, and then we're going to get into something that I have been talking a lot about. Um, I refer to it as uh, fish geometry. Uh, so it, it, to me, it's, uh, it, it was something that I was doing uh, uh, on a regular rod and reel. And I was also using the same uh, foundational skills on my Tenkara rod, it looked a little different. And it, it kind of led me to wonder why I was having the success that I was having. Uh, because a lot of people were saying I shouldn't be able to, uh, to do the things that I can do on a Tenkara rod, that it seemed impossible. And so it really uh, got me to thinking, well, why is this actually working? Uh, and then you know, then the next step was 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 trying to uh, to be able to explain it to other people so that it made sense. So um, let me see. I am going to uh, share my screen with you and see if we can't start this. Hopefully you can all uh, see Big Fish on Tenkara. We're going to talk about the power curve and fish geometry. So we're going to be doing a little bit of um, a little bit of math uh, eventually here. So um, just the quick and dirty, uh, the facts about Tenkara. They're telescoping rods. There are no guides, there are no reels. I did a, a Zoom presentation a couple weeks ago and about, uh, <laughs> about 15 minutes in, somebody wanted to know where the guides were. So uh, <laughs> he was new to Tinkar. There are no guides, there, are, uh, there is no reel. Uh, it's a fixed line system of fly fishing, been around for a very, very long time. Uh, there are different, um, uh, different cultures all over the globe that uh, have some um, history in this type of fixed line fishing. The Tenkar rods are ultra flexible, they're ultra light, which makes them highly transportable. And uh, because the way the line attaches uh, to the rod, it's, it's a faster setup and it's much easier to learn. And uh, as you can see in this, in this photo, uh, all the sections uh, when the rod is collapsed uh, uh, nest into uh, themselves. And you can see that 
these rods, uh, the rod blanks are very, very thin. So it's kind of amazing at how strong they are. Um, and of course, that's very different than a regular fly uh, rod that is not hollow like that. You attach uh, the lines uh, with a girth hitch to what is called a lillian at the very uh, end of the rod. It's the very uh, tip of the rod, the tip section. And uh, it's great for beginners because all you need to know is how to do a clinch knot in order to attach uh, your tippet to the line and then your fly to the tippet. Uh, and when you extend the rod, you have to make sure that you're extending from the tip section or the smallest section all the way, one at a time, extending them to the base or handle and then do it completely in reverse when you want to collapse the rod you're going from the biggest sections collapsing them down into the smallest section so that all those pieces nest properly here's a quick little video on how to attach the line you're going to take the cap off gently tip the rod over and you can get that first section, that red cord is called the lillian. And I like to just pull out the first section, put it between my knees uh, to hold it. You can tuck it under your shoulder as well, but it gives you two hands to work with. That's a little overhand knot that I put in my lillian. And that is a connection loop at the end of the rod. Simply or end the rod, simply pulling it through to create a little hitch, and then I'm going to make that that loop a little smaller. Hold it, and then put it around my Lillian, and I'm going to do a double wrap. That double wrap is important. Not everybody does it, but it's your safety net, along with that overhand knot be a little bumper so that you don't lose your line if you hook into something that's really aggressive. And then we're just gonna pinch it down. That is your line attachment. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, you want to make sure it's tight, give a little tug, and there you go. Okay. So when we talk about tankara, traditional tankara, uh, generally it was used on smaller waters and these rods are long. They're longer than uh, regular uh, fly rods. On average, they're about 12 feet. Uh, they do, uh, you can buy smaller and longer rods, but in general, 12 foot is considered a pretty typical length for a tankara rod. Uh, and you're attaching a relatively short line to the end of the rod. So what you uh, create when you fish is sort of a, I call this the Tenkara pyramid, uh, because you want to keep your rod tip up, the line off of the water, and only your fly is touching the surface. Uh, the rods are very sensitive, and so with an ultralight line, you can do a lot of um, uh, maneuvering and, um, and tweaking and playing with your fly in order to create action, uh, which is uh, very effective uh, and uh, attracts a lot of fish. Um, traditionally, uh, in Tenkara, you're using a, a, a kabari, a, a sakasa kabari. It's a uh, a hackle forward fly, and they don't really resemble anything. Uh, the hackle is tied forward so that when it gets wet and you do a little tapping uh, on your uh, end of the rod, um, little just boom, 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 you're getting an action out of that fly. So really it, all it's doing is creating um, uh, you know, it, it, it's acting as a stimulator or an attractor. And these flies are very productive if you're using them in faster moving water where fish don't have a whole lot of time to really contemplate 
you know, is that something I want to eat? Uh, where they have just just an instant to hit it um, and um, and go on. So uh, they are very uh, effective, but I personally like to use my regular flies when I fish. Uh, I do uh, streamers, I do uh, nymphs, I do dry droppers, I do it all. Uh, anything that you put on a regular fly rod, you can put on a tin car rod. So let's go back to the presentation. Okay. Oops. So, oops, sorry about that. So if you are fishing small creeks and small streams and you are catching, you know, trout in the uh, six to 12 inch uh, range, uh, really, uh, it's pretty easy to land these fish. As I said, you have a, traditionally a relatively short line and you have a long rod. So when you pull back on the, on the rod and you kind of bring it behind you, that line and fish simply come in close to you. Uh, generally close enough, uh, you know, an eight inch uh, Brook trout is not very hard to drag across uh, the riverbed. So you're simply reaching out, grabbing that line. Uh, you generally transfer it into your other hand, and then that fish is right there at your feet uh, where you can either scoop them into a net or if you're using barbless hooks or you're crimping barbs, uh, literally just give the hook a little wiggle and he's off uh, back to his uh, wonderful little fish home in the river. The problem uh, I do have with this illustration, uh, and I'm not IT savvy enough to reproduce it and make it better, um, is in the, in the, the second shot uh, where the, the uh, angler is grabbing the line. Uh, that is something that I like to warn people about. If you reach out and you grab that line in front of you, what you will ultimately do is you will pull the tip of your rod down closer to you, tightening it as you transfer it into your other hand, and you're going to overload that top section where I have the uh, oval up on the top of that illustration. And that's where I have many customers, uh, those that are new, uh, they uh, contact me and they say, right when I was landing the fish, my tip broke uh, or, you know, section two or three snapped. And I know exactly why it happened uh, because they've reached out in front of them and then when they transfer that line, they're putting more pressure and overloading the top section. So I always tell people when you uh, are going to land that fish, you wanna kind of do a, a, a little bend over and reach down a little bit lower, doesn't have to be really low, um, you know, simply um, a foot or two. And when you grab that line and transfer it into your other hand, what you'll actually be doing is releasing pressure from the top section of your rod and safeguarding uh, your rod from any breaks uh, in those, mo those last few moments when you are landing your fish. So that's a very important uh, little tip that will uh, save, uh, save breaks. So, Keep moving here. So, like I said, it's pretty easy to land, you know, six to 12 inch uh, trout or little crappies or sunfish um, with your tin car rod and not having to be too concerned about, um, you know, things going wrong or even having to do a whole lot of fish management just because of their size. But when you get into a bigger fish like this one or this guy who's filling that net or this guy, uh, then 
you have to change your method a little bit because if you pull back on the rod, you are absolutely going to overload the top sections. You're also probably going to lose the fish because of what I call the bounce effect that that soft tip section uh, is going to allow for. Uh, these were all fish that I uh, literally caught uh, last weekend, um, this last Saturday on a uh, grave reef. Uh, I did a float trip with a couple of other people. Uh, we did Tinkara. It was just fantastically um, successful. In fact, out of a party of 10, I outfished everybody. And I was, uh, we had, uh, Two other people on Tinkara, uh, everybody else was on Rod and Reel. And I creamed, creamed the group. So closed curves are not a good thing in the Tinkara world, okay? Uh, I, 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 I tell people, you always want to avoid turning your Tinkara rod into a candy cane. Because when you do that, again, you're overloading the top section. So candy canes are bad. We never turn our rods into candy canes. When you turn your rod into a candy cane, you overload the top section and you underuse the bottom sections. So you literally have no backbone to your rod. And again, if you're landing really small fish, that's not such a big deal. But the bigger the fish you get into, the more you have to engage your entire rod. And really at that point, you're counting on the backbone of your rod to be able to give you control over the fish. So I like to say it's all about the curve when we're talking about Tinkara. So I'm just gonna stop real quick here. Does anybody have any questions um, at this moment before I go on? Because if not, I'm just gonna keep plowing through and hopefully the presentation will address everything. Are we good so far? I don't see any hands waving. I'm not seeing any chats. If, if you have a question, enter it into the chat menu because everybody's muted right now. Okay. So I'm not seeing any yet. Okay, perfect. All right. So it's all about the curve. And it's not just any curve, but it's a curve where the load of that fish is evenly distributed over the entire length of your rod. So even distribution, uh, we like to call that the power curve in Tenkara. Uh, that is when, when the stress is spread out, you're engaging the full 12 feet or whatever length of rod you have, and that's when your rod is, is the strongest, okay? Um, now, this is a, um, and a good example of the power curve, it's an open curve, almost like the C, a C, um, the letter C, you know, as I said, versus an upside down J. But uh, if you can turn that rod over slightly uh, and create an angle, it's, it's even better. It's going to give you more control. So these are all just some uh, quick photos of what a Tenkara looks like when it is engaged and when you are in control of the fish and you are in the power curve. You'll notice in these photos, all, in all of these pictures, the rod is at about a 45 degree angle off of the water, okay? Um, and their arm is out, but it isn't back behind them, you know, where you're dislocating your arm and actually pulling it uh, positioning the rod vertically up and down and then bringing the rod back. But it's actually off to the side 
And again, they're creating that letter C. So even though in this illustration, the curve is open, it's straight up and down. And when you're in that vertical position, even though you're distributing the load, you also are in a vulnerable position because of what I like to call the bounce effect. Because that, that first few feet of the rod is the softest part of your rod. And if you stay in this vertical position, even though your curve is open, with a fish bouncing and pulling, you're going to eventually get slack in the line. And then it makes you vulnerable for a thrown hook. So if you can lay that rod over closer to the surface of the water and work off the water to about a 45 degree angle, you are more in control, you will reduce the bounce effect, you'll be able to keep steady, constant pressure on the fish, and you'll have more control during the landing. And that's what it looks like again when you have your rod fully engaged and you're in a very powerful position. So even though up and down is better than a candy cane, it still makes you a little bit vulnerable. Off to the side, 45 degrees off the water with even distribution is better. I tell people the only time that you really want to go up into that vertical position is when you are about to land the fish and you are lifting the fish's head up so that you can bring a net in underneath. But you never want to stay in that vertical position for very long. Uh, maybe if you're turning the fish and you're laying the rod over from the left to the right in order to uh, manage and steer the fish, but you're not hanging up, uh, up at the top. That's, that eventually will lead to a, a thrown hook. So again, that's what that rod looks like. Uh, this is uh, fishing for uh, bonefish uh, and permit uh, off a flats boat. That's what that rod looks like, uh, fully engaged and in an open power curve. So you maintain the curve or maintaining the curve is maintaining the angle. And this is where I like to get into my little fish geometry. So in regular fly fishing, we would say it's about the angle. In Tenkara, we talk about a curve because our rods should never ever be straight. So you're never gonna have, you know, uh, you're never gonna have straight lines. And this was uh, something that I uh, was thinking about one day and thought, well, how, how is this working? I know it works, I'm not sure why it works, um, but I started to think about the geometry of it all. And big angles equals lots of control and small angles equal little or no control. So, in this illustration, um, this, is, this is actually an overhead il illustration to see the curve, and, and, and a tenkara rod would be that green dotted line. But in a regular fly rod, I mean, this, this still works uh, on a regular fly rod, but it also works if you were standing uh, next to this angler, if, this, if that dot in the illustration was an angler and you were standing downstream or upstream from him and watching him. So that the black line is your rod. Of course, you can see my, my great artwork of my bluefish. And then 
your a red line is basically the line and you know what and what creates the angle between your rod tip and the fish so if we go down to the bottom half of that picture and we look at the bottom three drawings okay in those illustrations the fish is running so if we go to the very very bottom right a fish runs you lay your 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 rod out flat and so that line can get through those guides nice and easy and the fish runs okay and when the fish runs you you really don't have any control at that point you're letting the fish take line off your reel and he's taking off as he starts to slow down or tire out, you start to get back on your reel. And when you do that, you simultaneously start to lift the rod to increase the angle, okay? The more you pull back on the rod and you reel that line in, the more in control of the situation you are okay and that happens consistently until you're actually when you're about to land a fish you're actually sometimes leaning back right on big fish you're almost leaning backwards pulling that rod back and your rod is bending and you're bringing that fish in to be netted now Every time that fish takes off to run, you drop your rod down, okay? In Tenkara, if you drop your rod down, you have no way to recover. The fish is not able to take any line off the reel. There is no reel. So if you lay your rod down and allow it to straighten, the fish is going to pop the tippet or break your lillian off the rod, okay? A straight rod should never happen in the tin car world. It's an absolute done deal and you cannot recover from it when you your most powerful position on a tin car rod is the upper two illustrations on the top when you are either in a 90 degree angle but this would be off to the side not up and down vertically but laying the rod over so we're going to switch to a bird's eye view in these illustrations or a greater curve up to about 135 degrees. And I say 135 degrees because if you lay your rod back any more than 135 degrees, you're actually going to create a candy cane effect because the further you bring your rod back, if you lay it out completely straight from the fish, you know, opposite the fish, now you have a, a, a rod straight and only the tip bending, which will break. So that sweet pot spot in the Tenkar world is about 135 degrees to about 45 degrees. If you go past 45 degrees, it's, you're in trouble. And at that point, you actually need, since you don't have a reel, to move your feet to catch up to the fish and get back into the curve. So I want you to really look at the, the, this illustration because it, it not only will help you with Tenkara, and managing fish if you understand that curve and and that open curve at about you know you if you can keep your rod with an angle 
between your rod tip and the fish at about 100 degrees, you're going to always be in control. But it also will help you with your regular rod and reel setup in understanding when you lose control and how to utilize your rod and those angles to manage the fish better so you don't have to let the fish run to wear him out in order to land him, okay? So let's move on. So this is um, another illustration that I saw uh, by Ted Kramer, Current Works. Um, and when I saw it, this is what made me start thinking about what was really happening. And so um, this is fish judo working collaboratively with the fish. And so in this scenario, you have a big fish that you hook into. Uh, and he starts to head downstream, but unfortunately, there's a down tree or a log uh, just slightly downstream. And so he's hopped into uh, a heavy current, and you can't let the fish run. You can't let him take line off of the reel, because if he reaches that, that log or that tree, he's going to bury himself in it, and he's gonna break off. So what do you do in a situation like this? You have to stop that line, not let the fish take another inch off the reel, and you need to use the fish's own momentum to turn him away from the current and into the softer water where you can regain control. So this is the exact same method you use on a Tinkara rod, but you're doing this every time. So this is a, a couple of pictures that I, um, I wanted to share with you. Uh, it is actually off of a video uh, this year. I was lucky enough to go down to the Seychelles um, that is uh, off the coast of Africa uh, uh, and uh, about 900 miles away from Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. Um, we were fishing for bones uh, on this particular day. I also got to, uh, caught my first GT, not on a Tinkara rod, um, but I, I was being uh, filmed in, in this bonefish fight. Uh, he was a good size bone. They grow them big down there. And I was throwing about a 45 foot setup and on a 12 foot rod. And I landed the fish and it actually didn't take me very long. It's usually shorter than on a rod uh, and reel because they aren't running. And when I got home, I was watching the video and kind of going through it uh, uh, frame by frame and trying to learn from it, which is what I like to do. And, you know, the, the fight was obviously very fresh in my mind. You know, I, I had experienced it uh, when I was looking at the photos, I was reliving it. Uh, actually, my heart rate went up and my, 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 my pulse, started going crazy. Uh, my blood pressure went up a little bit more. It, it was kind of funny because I was reliving it. Um, but I, I, was, I, I was actually being able to experience it while simultaneously watching, uh, watching what was happening. And you know, you're so engrossed at the moment. Uh, I do watch my rod and my fly uh, through the whole thing. Um, I watch my fly uh, more than I actually watch the fish, uh, but when I slowed everything down and still framed it, I actually got to see what was happening with the rod. And in this upper left-hand corner, uh, you can see I'm in a curve, but I am really <laughs> struggling at this point. Okay, I I I, I got that. A uh, deep bend in the curve, but in this instant, 
the bone is starting to run. And you can see that the top section of my rod is starting to straighten out. If we move to the right, you can see I'm almost, for you know, lack of a better word, screwed at this point. My rod is almost completely straight. And in order to recover from this, and, and we're talking about this is just moments. I mean, the whole thing only took about two and a half minutes. Um, but you can see in that picture, my feet are moving. I, I'm not running, you know, the 60 yard dash, but I had to take two or three steps very quickly to catch up to my rod and the fish and get back into a curve. And you can see in the lower left hand corner, I have now stopped and I am bringing the fish back around. I'm turning him using his momentum. And then in the bottom right, you can see that rod in a full flex mode. And now I am back in control. So you always want to maintain the curve to maintain the fish. You never want your rod to straighten out. You never want to throw your rod in the water. Uh, there's, you know, some folklore myth about doing that and uh, good luck in retrieving it. Uh, unless you have a river caddy who's going to go swim for it, uh, you can say goodbye to your rod. So this is uh, up in Alaska. Uh, we, this is up in Rapids Camp. Uh, beautiful rainbow all on Kara. Uh, this was uh, another bone in the Seychelles. I'm just a little bit excited and having fun. <laughs> another beautiful char. All on Tenkara, no real necessary. Wonderful uh, pooter uh, fish, no need for a reel. So when you're working those fish, especially in these high waters where uh, right now where we have runoff and uh, I mean the flow is just really ripping through. Uh, it was what I had to do up in uh, Gray Reef last weekend. Um, you have to have a plan. Now if you are waiting or if you are on a shore, uh, you might have to move your feet. Uh, there, there's only been one time uh, in all my years of doing this that I've actually had to run uh, and I actually have a video of it that if you're interested, um, I will share with you. It was on a, uh, uh, a good size uh, silver uh, that had just come in from the ocean and was very, very strong. Um, but generally you have to take one or two uh, steps, maybe at most, in order to keep your rod uh, in that power curve. Uh, Again, you want to maintain the curve and work collaboratively. Use the fish's own momentum to uh, steer and turn him into soft water where you have control. And if you are uh, getting into some bigger fish, uh, I've, I've net, uh, netted many, many fish myself. Uh, I've hand lined plenty of um, uh, big rainbows, browns, uh, I handlined bonefish, I handlined uh, dollies, chars, uh, chum salmon. Um, but if you can have a, a buddy uh, to, to net it for you, that's, that's, always, uh, that's always helpful. This is uh, just a quick little video. Um, it's actually not too quick. This is on the pooter. I've just hooked into a decent rainbow. This isn't a massive fish, but he's a very respectable fish. I'm fishing about a 25 foot setup here uh, on a, our Sumenka rod, which is about a six weight equivalency. Um, the river gets pretty deep. It, it, 
it's kind of like a V. So I'm having to really stick to the edge here. Um, and, and then of course you see the bank. Um, the fish really wants to get into that faster moving water right out in the middle. And so I'm trying really hard to steer him and keep him towards the edge. I'm worried about the drone over my head. So uh, I'm prematurely grabbing the line because that fish is not ready to come in yet. But you'll see, I've got the rod turned over and I'm kind of trying to stay low to the water. Uh, I'm turning the rod, working about 45 degrees off the surface, keeping steady, constant pressure. I don't want there to be slack in the line. And as I'm doing that, I'm going to grab that line. He's not ready to come in. I'm using his momentum just to turn him, keep him where I want, keep him in tight to the bank. I'm not running or panicking, although I. I am feeling pressured by the drone overhead. I always say, you know, give the fish butt and stick your own butt out. Uh, it seems to help to kind of get into a lower position. Nope, he's not quite ready. I'm gonna be patient, ignore the drone. And I'm gonna come in. You can see that rod really bouncing. He's trying to run. You can see it really flexing there. You see, I'm looking at the rod, making sure that I have a nice, a nice broad curve in it. And then I grab the line. I grab kind of low, relieved the pressure. So I'm not going to snap that tip. And I'm just keeping steady pressure again on the fish, bringing the line in. And again, I'm being pressured by that drone because <laughs> he's not quite in close enough. So I need to grab it just one more time and bring it in. And there he is. And um, he's up. He's a decent rainbow, but you know, there wasn't a lot of, uh, wasn't a lot of drama. It was nice and easy. Uh, very, very chilled sort of landing, um, but he's a good size. He's a good size fish, very respectable. And that's kind of how it works. Uh, so I'm gonna come back here. And I have a couple of other videos. I have two other ones. They're about, um, I don't know, about a, a minute each. Uh, I, don't, I don't think they're more than two minutes, but do we have questions? Uh, I kind of went through that uh, a little fast, but I wanted to make sure I got it all in and was able to answer questions. We do have a question. Uh, the question is, how do you use streamers? I love uh, streamers. I'm a little bit of a streamer addict, uh, and um, that is, um, that's my, my preferred way of fishing. So, uh, I, as I said, you can put anything on a tankar rod that you would put on your regular uh, rod and reel, including streamers. Um, and so you can't strip right with your reel so what you end up doing is laying that rod over to the side and remember it's a you know it's a 12 foot rod so it's it's like a giant lever and a very small movement at at the handle end transfers into a very sizable motion uh at the tip end so uh when i fish streamers i'm laying my rod over and simply doing little twitches like this as I bring my rod back and up and at the kind of the last uh, motion, the last sort of jig, 
I am, because I'm lifting my rod tip up, I'm actually water loading the line and usually can do just sort of a final pop and load, load the rod and bring, um, bring my fly back down into the water. So it's a very easy process and it's very effective. Your, your, your distance that you cover with the strip is a little, is a little uh, shorter, but I would say because you're not doing a lot of casting and you're just lifting it and putting it back in, uh, you've got a lot of, you know, your streamer is in that water a lot and you know, you, you're, you're catching a lot of fish. It's very effective. Good question. Any other questions? I, I actually, I have a question. Oh, here's another one. How to attach a Euro nymphing rig onto the Tinkara rod. That was You're, my question too. I'm sorry? <laughs> that was my question too. <laughs> okay. So you're, you're, you're setting up, you're tying on that bottom section uh, just like you would, um, you know, you're tying uh, fluorocarbon on, uh, you can uh, tie in tag ends or whatever you want with your nymphing. Um, you know, I told you I was, well, I certainly wasn't Euro nymphing, but um, I was throwing uh, beads and um, bead eggs uh, and uh, big stickers, <laughs> uh, but I, I like to nymph a lot, uh, and I generally do not use any kind of an indicator. It really bothered me up at the Gray Reef using an indicator. I don't like them, um, but this is uh, one of our lines. Let's see if I can get that in the camera, and so there is a loop at the end. So this is, this is the bottom of the line that you would connect uh, your tippet to. And if you can see there, I think you can see, notice there's a tippet ring. If you were going to fish this traditional by uh, tying straight tippet uh, and using that tippet ring. But there's also a loop to loop connection there. So you can go ahead and build your nymphing rig. Uh, you can attach a regular uh, tapered leader to this. So again, it, it's no different than how you would set it up on a regular rod and reel. You're gonna tie it in exactly the way you would on uh, your regular line. I've even, when I've done salt water, uh, you know, tied in sinking heads, uh, which is you know, certainly not check nymphing or anything, but I'm saying, you know, if that's what you need to do to get down, there's, there's no problem in doing that, you know, and you put on a, a big uh, tungsten uh, uh, bead uh, fly to get yourself down there. Uh, and what I love about these particular uh, lines is, uh, if you notice uh, this high vis section, so when we designed these, we built in eight inches of a high vis section. So that kind of acts as your indicator and there is no stretch to these lines. So um, you get an immediate hook set. Everything is kept very tight. Uh, so Tenkara rods are wonderful uh, for check nymphing. Uh, we actually have a rod our, uh, which, which comes with, uh, you can switch out tips. Um, one of them is, uh, well, the rod is called the Sumenka and it has a nymphing tip that's very stiff um, so that you can throw really heavy setups and get a solid hook set uh, because sometimes uh, when you're going really deep and you have a heavier set, uh, set up or rig, you know, the, the, the soft tip on a Tenkara rod sometimes uh, is a little tricky. People uh, will, often miss those hook sets uh, because they have to account for that, you know, that flex in the tip. So you have to set quick and you have to set a little bit harder uh, on uh, standard Tinkar rods. Uh, but as I said, we, we actually have a nymphing rod that, we, that when we designed it, we wanted it to have backbone, we wanted it to have a stiff tip, 
Uh, so you could pull the, you know, throw, throw heavy uh, rigs, pull those lunkers up out of the, uh, the bottom of the river. So did that answer your question? Helps me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. What kinds of lines do you recommend for different types of fishing? So I'm, um, like I said, I am, I am the farthest from traditional uh, that there could be. I, I will sometimes fish Tinkara uh, traditionally. Uh, I'll go out there for a day and, and use you know, my ultralight lines and my Sakasa Kabares and I'll play with it and, you know, really do a lot of manipulations and it's wonderful. Um, but I also use it for saltwater. I use it up in Alaska. I've used it on float trips in Costa Rica for Nachaca. I've done all kinds of crazy things. Um, and so the lines are where you can get crazy in Tenkara. Um, for, for most, you know, the majority of fishing in Colorado, I'm using um, our, our Zen floating lines that we actually produce here. The raw material is made in Colorado and then they are assembled um, and, and actually manufactured here in Colorado. So we're real proud of that. Um, these lines come in six different lengths. So for the most part, um, you know, I, depending on, you know, where I'm fishing or what river I'm fishing, um, I, I've got a length that will work really well. They are floating lines. So if I do want to throw in a lake or I'm fishing, um, you know, bigger water and I, I need a 20 foot cast because the fish are kind of spooky, um, you know, this comes in a length up to 22 feet. So I'm, I'm covered. And, and I will say, you know, there, there are some rivers, um, that, that, that one where I uh, was landing the rainbow, um, you notice there were no tree anywhere around. Actually, there are some eagles uh, in the area that have nests. And so the fish are super skittish. And they don't rare, you know, it's very rare that they will come up for a dry fly. Um, I've, I've landed many fish, you know, with marks on the back from talons. Um, so you have to be, you know, at least 20 feet away. Uh, you, you, you can't get anywhere near the fish. They just shut down because they're so spooked. Um, so I will often, you know, throw a 18, 20 foot line. Uh, with, you know, an eight foot uh, tapered leader onto it. And I'll, I'll have a streamer. Um, we are in the process of uh, actually collaborating with Rio, which is very, very exciting. I'm very flattered that, um, that, <laughs> that they liked uh, our idea and uh, enough to, uh, create prototypes for us and, and want to take it on as a, as a, as, as a project. We're a small project for them. Um, everything got shut down because of the virus. Uh, so their manufacturing facilities closed. Uh, but I have been testing uh, prototype lines that are made out of traditional fly fishing material. Uh, and they have, uh, loops and connection points on either side, but we are working to match grain weight and creating profiles on these lines that um, depending on which way you attach them to the rod, you'll either get a delicate presentation or you'll get a weight forward presentation with a quick turnover. Um, and so we have been we've been experimenting with different uh, profiles and where to kind of put that, that belly um, in order to, to get the kind of turnover we want, uh, but still have a nice presentation and not just slapping the water. Those are, are being developed uh, primarily for our big rods, um, but we will also be eventually, probably be offering uh, them for our like our five weight and our six weight rods. Um, 
right now I do a lot of um, <laughs> fly line crafting, <laughs> what I like to call. Uh, so I, you know, anytime I have line uh, stripped off my rod and reel, I always ask for it back and I chop it up uh, to uh, make uh, lines for my Tenkara rod. And based upon where I cut it, whether I use the level, uh, the you know, the running line, or whether I um, include some of the weight forward section or belly section, I can uh, create different kinds of lines for different purposes. So I have a lot of customers uh, that contact us <laughs> you know, telling me that they're going here or they're going there or they're fishing for this kind of fish and that kind of fish. And, uh, you know, can I walk them through building a line? And, you know, sometimes I'm like, I have no idea what I have to Google what the fish is. because I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Um, but sure, I'll help you. And, uh, and so, you know, the, the lot when I, whenever I travel someplace, that I've never been before. I bring a line wallet, and um, I usually will carry, you know, about a, a half dozen different kinds of lines or lengths of lines with me. And then it's very quick to uh, switch a line out, as you could see from the video. Uh, and if I'm cutting a fly line, I literally am just doing an overhand knot. You know, I'm just making uh, an overhand knot, leaving the loop, and then putting that lily in, lacing it through twice, and cinching it down. That's all I'm doing, and that that gets so tight that sometimes you have to use your nippers and actually cut the line uh, because you know it, it it's not going anywhere. It's not going to come off your rod. If, if anything, it's hard to get off your rod. So. Lines are definitely uh, how you um, how you approach different environments and different types of water. So it's always, you know, if I'm go again going someplace new, I always say, you know, can can you show me pictures? Can you tell me about the water? Um, you know, how far am I going to have to cast on average? What is it going to be like? And then I make my lines based on that. So in Colorado, you know, uh, the, the floating tin car lines, you know, work just fine. You know, you don't really need to, to get crafty. So was that thorough enough? <laughs> <sighs> any well, other questions? I don't see any more questions. So let's thank Karen if we can, and you can use, do that by reactions on the lower right of your screen. And I just, I just want to definitely um, say, you know, whether you use Tenkara or your rod and reel, really think about those angles of your rod when you are managing and landing your fish. If you, if you use those angles. Um, even on a rod and, and, and reel, you will, you will not have to let the fish run as much, you know, and I'm talking big fish, uh, and you don't have to uh, tire them out as much to land them. You'll find that you have more control, uh, the landing is calmer and uh, easier and, and quicker, so. All right. Well, if that's it, thank you very much. Uh, and I appreciate you letting me present. Well, thank you, Karen. And uh, we're very appreciative of ourselves. So thank you very much. And I assume you have a website we can go to to order a rod. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and I answer questions. I have people contacting uh, me all the time uh, through our contact page. Uh, it's Zentenkara. Uh, dot com and um, as I said if you have questions you can email me I'd be happy to answer them directly uh, and uh, we have free shipping um, on all of our products right now we've been trying to do our part 
Uh, and uh, check out the destination pages because we've got some pretty exciting trips that will be coming up. So thank you so much. Very good. Thank you. All right. The link is also on uh, this month's calendar page. <laughs> well, <the> webmaster. <laughs> so very good. All right. Well, if there is nothing else from the gallery, we'll say good night and thank you all for joining us. Stay tuned. We'll be trying to get messages out through the summer to our membership, let you know what's going on. I think we'll probably have limited volunteer opportunities, but I think we will. We might have a, a few coming up, especially once uh, some of the restrictions are eased. So. Again, thank you everybody for joining us and until September, have a nice summer and catch a lot of fish. All right.